Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. was Welcome to Dino World, wasn't it? That was the first time. It was you and there was Nick Shaw was on there. Yes, yes. And we were yes. speaking about Welcome to Dino World. And then since then we did, we did the Roman Roll together with a different publisher, which yes. basically came from the fact that I've never played Roll and Rides before uh, Dino World, and I wanted to try and make it into a big and complicated game, and the publisher kept shutting me down, saying, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do that. I'm like, why not? It's because it's a Roll and Ride game, we can't do that. I'm like, who said that? <laughs> Is it is it the law? So uh, we went and did roll, a Roman roll, which is technically a roll and write game because you know you roll dice and then you yeah. write on a board, but it has much more in common with uh, medium heavy heavy euros than with any of the roll and writes on the market. So so you know I, I said roll and write is a mechanism, not a form, and broke the mold and. We're currently working on a <laughs> sequel, which is going to be a flip and write, but going to be as heavy as Roll and Roll. So, or maybe a little bit lighter to sell it to more people. But I, I like breaking the mold. Whereas sometimes I wonder if the masses just want the mold all over again. But so, hey, we're mold, going back to me, me complaining. So let's not mold do that. Mold is safe, though. Mold is safe. But for people that's just joined us, we've kind of just tripped into just chatting, but I'm joined by uh, David Turtsy, who is oh, no, yes, well known hi. for he's met well known <laughs> for lots of lots and lots of uh, different things. You've got your kitchen rush, which he was famous for. He's he obviously there was an, an acronym as, the, as well, which is uh, the internet, the internet darling, um, which he was well. But he's also done like Roman Roll. He was a, we we chatted a little while ago about uh, Welcome to Dinosaur Island that he did with Alley Cat Games. Di- di- but, Dino World, Dino World, Dino World. Yeah, sorry, Dinosaur going, Island is a different. game. It's a completely <laughs> different game altogether. But if there's a chance I'm going to mess it up, then I'm going to mess it up. Um, <clears throat> but. One of the things you're well known for, and well, my I guess there's two. Well, there's two things I've been exposed to you recently. Uh, one of them was the single, the uh, solo mode in Blitzkrieg. Which, yes, uh, I, I, which I, I, I am starting to become known as the solo mode guy. You are starting no, to become known as a solo mode guy. So, which is super weird to me because I don't even like playing solo. But <laughs> I've got to ask the question then: Is this not? Did, see when the, when folks said right okay you're gonna have to be isolated and stuff like that. Did you or are you like okay, my time has come because I'm just wondering if you're like ripping games off the shelf and and thinking well how can I solo mode this how can I solo mode that because solo no, mode solo has gone from kind of being quite it's gone from being yes. quite um, quite yeah. kind of off the thingy to being in a, a kind of a introduction as included in well, most games yeah. Well, let's 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 put it this way. My job mm. is to make games that I consider good and mm-hmm. games that I consider sellable. And right. uh, and <laughs> I and uh, especially on Kickstarter but even off Kickstarter but especially on Kickstarter, uh, the need for solo game is now a significant requirement. Uh, I don't want to name names on record, but one uh, <laughs> game I recently worked for had a paid solo add-on. Yes. And out of several thousands of backers, more than 60% of them bought the paid add-on. 60, 60. So what? Okay, why is that then? I mean, because are we... Is it because... Okay, look it's at it this way. Is it because the good games shame? come... It probably. I think good games come faster than friends willing to learn them. That's that's my first feeling, because the yeah. people who play board games for social fun don't run out of friends for games. Therefore, they don't need solo. But yes. the hobbyists, 
the 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 ones that game for gaming's sake either start collecting and not playing or collecting and then go yeah i really want to try that out and then if you give them a solo mode where they can play the true game not some butchered variant of it yeah then they'll consider that as a extra maybe they're the heaviest gamer of their group maybe nobody around them wants to play a three-hour heavy strategy game but they want to so do they never play a three-hour strategy game again, or do they sit down and 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 I mean, there's no, there should never be any stigma attached to it because we play video games alone all the time. Why why couldn't I move a piece of cardboard around alone? And again, I'm saying this while me personally not playing them. Well, maybe it's a number of moving parts because I can imagine. I can imagine. I, I mean, you're right because I know people that will sit there and quite happily play. Um, board game adaptations on their mobile phone. I mean, I've, I mean, I've recently kind of got through yeah. the, the campaign mode on Charter Store. It, it, it depends that, you know, on why people play board games. People who play board games for the people will never mm-hmm. understand the need for a solo mode. People who play for the puzzling out the game, and those people naturally play heavier, more complicated bits and handle more moving parts better. Mm-hmm. Those are just a matter of uh, being able to sit in one place. I mean, I don't play too much solo games because if I play 15 minutes alone without talking to anybody, I start to lose whose turn it is and, and have I made who I wanted to. But that's that's my attention span. That's, that's because there's 200 things going on my head at any one moment. About 190 of them is a new game. So I'm... But I know what people who enjoy that want from it, and which is why I can design these solo modes. And then I have friends of mine and volunteers who who love playing them, and they've worked with me so much that I can give them an 80-90% finished solo mode, and then they start playing and they wing it. And when, when I forgot about something, they just pencil it in. And then after mm-hmm. they played it 10, 15 times, I go through the rule book that they penciled in and, and ri- change a few, simplify a few, rebalance a few, reword a few, and then say, this is it, guys, this is the solo mode. And then that goes out to players, and then that's how we get Teotihuacan, that's how we get uh, uh, Kanban EV, and, and then people say, how do you make good solo modes? I'm like, I make people who like them play it. And and because I don't like doing, uh, I'm, I'm doing air quotes here, boring solo modes, I'm yeah. setting very high uh, very high standards for me to jump. Is there a high standard that you look to? Is there any games that you know you think have got solo mode really, really right that you would kind of say, "I'd you know, I'd love to do something similar to what they've done." I mean, you're asking the wrong kind of person because I strongly suspect Gaia uh-huh. Project has a very good solo mode. But yeah, I just said I'm not playing solo mode, so I will never find out. <laughs> but but all my testers play all these things, and I always ask them, hey, guys, am I good enough? Am I keeping up with the wave? And as long as they're saying yes, I'm happy. And and once, the, as I said, Camp Benivi hits or Foundations of Rome hits or, mm. or like, yes, like, like it's a... It's a it's a front of new challenges and, and, and they don't take too long for me to do. They, you know, <laughs> I want to say easy buck, but it's not that easy, but like comparatively comparative to designing a game, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's easy. So, you know, are you just able to look at a game and say, right, yes. this is how I would yes. do the solo mode because the blitz, yes. the blitz yes. Craig, what I noticed about that, was I did the, that in a day. The solo mode on Blitzkrieg, it was it, but it was remarkably different. It was remarkably different from the kind of the main, the main game in terms of how you would uh, play it. In fact, the size of the rules for the solo mode was, you know, as big as the base um, game. Like, yes, yeah, but that's yeah, big. Probably, that's yeah, because yeah. that's because Blitzkrieg, the entire game is a push mm-hmm. your luck, guess how far the enemy is pushing their luck kind of game. Yeah. And the one thing a bot can never do is guess. Yeah, exactly. So, so you I have to have program. To you have got to program so it all in, then, basically. So I had to turn the game into a, a variable priority 
mm. I bet you can't out guess me kind of uh it, it it's almost like like I said that when I play I either focus on A and then cho- choose between these priorities or I focus on that and then I choose between these priorities yeah. and then I took each of these possible tar- things to focus on and I made them into a stratagem tile each and I said the bot will draw a random stratagem tile and focus on that and 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 then I sent it over to Nick Show, you know my co-designer on Dino World and Roll yeah, yeah. and Roll, yeah, and then yeah, he played yeah. it for a week, and then he wrote up a lot of uh, tiebreakers, and 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 then we were like, yeah, we're done. So, and and when Paolo first played it, he was horrified how how <laughs> a super simple and super elegant solo uh, game come with such a complicated solo mode, but. Then he played it and went, "Ha! Huh, the 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 decisions are actually there." Yes. And yeah. and yes, for somebody who's not a solo gamer, it's a surprisingly lot of moving parts to manage. But again, the people who play for social fun, who play with, have fun with other people, they're never the target audience of my solo modes. My solo modes are targeted to the people who want to experience the full strategic depth of a game without the availability of other players. And those people won't mind the extra finickiness. So, have you know? I mean, since you're, and since everybody's in some kind of form of social distancing or isolation, has your day to day kind of changed on what you're doing on a day to day basis? Are you pretty much, is it just Fund- kind fundamentally, of the same? no? Fundamentally, yeah. no, because I've always been sitting at home on a laptop having Skype calls with various companies on all over the planet. So that mm. hasn't changed. The thing that has changed is that previously, once or twice a week, I could call friends around and say, come over and play this prototype with me, and now I can't. But on yeah. the other hand, that's almost been helpful because some publishers have been using Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator before, while mm. most of the publishers were like, nah, we just cut and paste it and play it in the office. Yeah. Which meant that when I wanted to play it, I either needed them to ship me a copy or I had to spend days building a copy of myself to play with my friends. But yeah, now yeah. because they can't go into the office, they build a tabletopia to play it amongst each other, which means me seeing three countries away, I can still play. So so it, it actually yeah. made it easy, easier for me to partake in, in publishers' playtesting because previously they would have been okay with playing in the office whereas now they all play on tabletop we're on tabletop simulator and and i'm comfortable with those systems so you know more fun does that mean that when you are um helping with the design side of things you're able to actually drop in your ideas into um tabletop simulator as well kind of log in and say "Look, look here's here's my stuff or does it take a different kind of building i don't know i haven't designed a full especially not a collaborative game mm. using this method yet. I did design one game since the lockdown has started, but that game was an evolution of another existing game already. So mm-hmm. I-, I could eyeball all the numbers and then build a complete game on Tabletop Simulator and then, okay, let's start playing and and then just tweak the numbers. So the initial concept I knew would was working because the initial concept was an existing game, which I'm not allowed to say at this point. But... Yeah. Like I haven't designed a new game digitally yet. I am working on on one or two new games now. Uh, they're still in the conceptualization phase, so I haven't made any bits yet. But I'm guessing I, I'll still make paper bits first and then see yeah. how to move them digitally, just because the visualization and 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 know how to handle and that sort of stuff. But yeah, but the 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 lockdown doesn't stop every life so i have one game on kickstarter right now i don't know if you've seen it excavation earth yes have it you looks checked stunning. it out it well, looks absolutely lovely you know my job is to tell you that it doesn't just look pretty it also does smart <laughs> it, it, does, it's, it does clever it's emotional yes. it's caring it's everything no, you would look for in a it's kind of definitely a not caring <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's heartless it's hard. It's a bold claim, calculating. though, because you're you're claiming you can teach the fundamentals, the basics of the game within ten minutes. 
Oh yes, is I that can. true or is that mark is that market is that marketing spiel? Okay, let let, let let me have a go at it. At the beginning right. of the game, you at the beginning of each round, you draft six cards out of eight, two at a time. Then once mm-hmm. you have your hand of cards, uh, we go around in turn order. And uh, when it's your turn, you play exactly two cards, taking one action each. Uh, the actions are travel, where you move your pieces up to as many moves total as the fuel icon on the card you discarded. Excavate, on which you pick up one or two tiles from the board of uh, matching the color of the card you played and having pieces on those locations where you pick them up from, and you can only pick up one per location max. And you have mm-hmm. to have space in your player board to put them, and you can take a sample of it, which the uh, is a I like to call it the space bingo set collection of rows and columns, <laughs> which at the end of the game will score you points depending on how many columns and rows you filled. Uh, yeah. After that, there is the market action where you can add colored meeples to a market where you're present by, by playing a card matching the icon of that market. And you can add one trader to it, which will be relevant for the next action. Uh, adding meeples to a market is good because the more of a particular color is out, the more valuable that color artifacts are. And having more meeples on the market where you are is better because the better your selection will be. Uh, if you want, I can continue, but I already explained a third of the game. <laughs> so, how long did it take you to put the game together? I mean, was it a, was it another one of these? It was very very quick to get the basics. Down? No, this was an extremely long one to put together because really? it because this because this wasn't a targeted. I know exactly what I want. Boom, kind of game. Uh-huh. This actually came from an idea that uh, my ex-wife had three and a half years ago. She woke me up wow. on a July morning at 4 a.m. and said, I designed the game. I was like, good. We'll play it in a month and it'll be in, it'll be good in two years. Now let me go back to sleep. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and she started from the theme. She wanted to... Um, um, what's what's the word? Uh, unicorn trainer. She wanted to rein yeah. a unicorn t- trainer company, and that turned into a fantasy horse race game, and that turned into a fantasy horse race betting game, and that turned into a fantasy horse race betting future value trading game, uh, yeah. and and it had multi use cards and drafting and. Uh, and player powers and 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 the collectible powers and set collection and everything and it was very smart and nobody understood what the hell was happening. So <laughs> when I showed it to a publisher, they were like, "Good, can you yeah. explain without using any theme words what we're actually doing so we can understand what's happening?" And and I explained, it's like, "Good, we need a new theme." <laughs> and then so who I, came up with then, a theme? Was that you? They came up with a theme then. Uh, I came up with, after talking to people from Mighty Boards and to, at that time, still my wife, and uh, we came up with uh, 1920s uh, Indiana Jones-ish museums. And, mm-hmm. uh, and the central mechanism of the game is that you can sacrifice cards to increase the value of one of the assets. And in the unicorn game, this was represented by horses moving forward on a racetrack. But people all misunderstood because they thought it's a race game and they thought they wanted their horse to win. No, Mm -hmm. you wanted to push your horse forward on the racetrack and then sell the tickets you had for it. And that's the bit nobody got. But when we turned it into this museum game, uh, and I think that's my biggest contribution to the process of the game, it was, uh, okay, so the popularity of a thing to be exhibited is measured by how many people queue up to see it. Right. So instead of moving horses forward on a horse track, we were adding colored meeples to queue in a market, uh, queue in a, in a museum. And if there were five yellow meeples queuing across all the museums and seven red meeples queuing across the museums, that meant red was worth more than yellow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this suddenly made sense. Well, whereas... <laughs> The the frozen in time uh, horse race uh, made no sense to anybody. So so I took the idea that she had from a from a thematic wish list, and we were fishing for good mechanisms for it. Then I took the mechanism, found a new theme for it, 
added these meeples that that made it pop for everybody because suddenly there was a reason to go to different markets because yeah. it was not enough to have a lot of yellow meeples on the market. You also wanted a lot of yellow meeples in the market where you were selling because you only, like the total number of yellows set the price, but the number of yellows in your market set the money you got for it. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, so one is one was like a bonus, the other one was like a unit price. That's the easiest way to explain. And uh, and and then I showed it to Mighty Boards again, and they were like, "Okay, this is much 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 better." But uh, now it's now can we make it stand out a bit, and can we make it cooler? And that's where I normally post my the the meme of you know aliens. So yeah, exactly. So Gordon came up with the aliens. And changed the game from the Great Excavation to Excavation Earth, and that's why yeah. how we moved from 1920s to the future, and uh, and then that inspired a few more mechanisms that inspired asymmetric alien races, uh, that inspired uh, uh, changed the train tickets into fuel cards, etc. So so the game is always ever evolving with its theme. So there is no what comes first theme or mechanism because both. So with the stuff that you leave out, the stuff that you've stripped away, do you save it for another game? I mean, if you got Usually ideas no. with the stuff, yeah, it sometimes inspires, but I think it's it's more likely to learn what I thought throughout and why is more uh-huh. important, so that I don't try to invent the same thing next time. It's like uh, half a year ago, I was working on a tableau building worker placement game. Yeah. And I had to price the buildings, the buildings affects the buildings. How often can you re-trigger it? What does it cost to re-trigger it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, yeah, and the yeah. problem I was bumping into was that I was trying out several different things. And I came to the conclusion that the best solution is what Anachrony did. So, because I already gone through this process once many years ago in an acronym. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, so that's yeah. how you, uh, if you want to put victory points on a building, this is how you price it against its effect, against its cost. If the cost is independent, if the effect is independent, then these are the, and, and I've already done this on an acronym and I'm bloody happy with an acronym. Therefore, <laughs> if I'm trying to do the exact same thing, the best solution will be the same solution. So, I needed to figure out how can I do it differently enough so that the best solution wouldn't be the same. And and similarly, when when uh, 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 I was working on a dice drafting game and somebody mentioned, oh, let's buy each other's dice and if somebody uses your die, you'll get a yeah. bonus for it. And I was like, yeah, I worked on a dice drafting game three years ago and it had that mechanism and it was hilariously broken. <laughs> So you're able so, to tell them, let's just put it to one side. So it's more a case for you of this isn't this doesn't work. Let's save yeah. everybody some time on the exactly. playtesting. Exactly. So in th- it's okay. This is this is what I call consulting development. It's like my job is not to be the greatest inventor. My job is not to be the uniquest theme. My job is not to be the 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 next Azul because I'm I'm not gonna be those guys. My job is to have a little bit better tool for anything. And and I have those you, tools because I suffered through these all through <laughs> many different games. And that's why I make different games. I I don't I would never make an acrony two and an acrony two but an acrony three but in an ancient cavern. An acrony yeah. the three but for two players. An acrony four but this time in a German farm. Oh wait, am I just listing? Oh no, I know. And then an acronym five this time with Vikings. And then I've definitely <laughs> listed off all Uwe Rosenberg titles. <laughs> I was gonna say the next one's gonna be with Egyptians, but that might be just a bit too close to the bone. <laughs> well, no. Uh, the, the, first of all, my next one is about Egyptians, but no, the, uh, the there is no Egyptian Agricola yet. So the, the joke was that you know Agricola Caverna. Uh, uh, you know, do you, do you um do you find it easier to pitch to people now that you've been doing this for a little while? Do you still kind of get the the kind of the 
a little bit of the nerves as to how it's going to come across. So you 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 kind of fairly confident in your skills. I bloody as a I bloody developer. hate pitching. I don't think right. I'm good at it. Right. My games, if I've done my job right, my game should speak for itself. I, I can talk yeah. a lot, but but what interests me is not what interests the public, so I don't know. But luckily, being somebody enough means that I rarely have to pitch. I call up a publisher and say, hey, do you want me to make you a game about this? How heavy do you want it? How long do you want it? What's my component <laughs> budget? Uh, what theme do you want for it? Yeah, and then I take notes, and then I deliver them that game, and I only deliver it to them. I don't deliver it to anybody else. And and I have three or four publishers that I can call ahead before designing a game, and they just tell mm-hmm. me if they and if they say sorry, our schedule is full, then then yeah. then, then I'm not bothered. Every now and then I get a passion project that I must design because I want to design it, and that that needs pitching, and sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, and sometimes it's lucky. And sometimes the the I was going to say, is there still a couple of passion projects you'd like to get somebody to work with and publish on? There's still like the huge um, behemoth game to kind of come. Oh in. yeah, I definitely have a huge behemoth game I want to design, but well, like I haven't got around to it. But but I have a publisher for that when I do. Uh, mm-hmm. I had two passion projects that were. Uh, that started out as a, oh, let's design it because this sounds like fun. And then, okay, but now who's going to publish it? Nobody wants it. Uh, but both of them got, we, I, I got lucky and, and, and I found publishers for both that were like, okay, I see what you're trying to do. Let's figure out how to change the game into something I can publish. Hmm. And, and, and both of those ended with happy endings. And one of them, Venice, did extremely well on Kickstarter. For a smallish publisher, but I think uh, Braincrack managed to pull off very good numbers on that. And that game was floating around for two years before that, and nobody was like, "What do you mean three to five player game with end of the game player elimination? That's insane." And and he was like, "Okay, can, can we tone down the the? Uh, can we make sure that it's really hard to eliminate yourself at the end?" And can we make it a one to five instead of a three to five? And can we make yeah. sure that you can't be completely blocked from an action? And you know, we kept toning it down until nobody cried. And then what was good <laughs> about the game was still in it, and what scared away people has gone away. So so that was an example of a of a of a game I did for fun and not for yeah. commission. And yet we managed to improve it enough to make it worthwhile. And what see in terms of brain crack, because they're I mean, I wouldn't say... I mean, they're the same stable as Alley Cat Games. I mean, they've put a couple of... Um, they put a couple of decent games out there now, but they've not... You know, the growth that Alley Cat Games has had has been, I would say, a little bit greater, even though I know that they kind of roughly started out at the same time. Well, that's because that uh, Alley Cat is a... Uh, Alley Cat is a multi-person... Like, like it's being run yeah. as a professional company, and, and Cesar is... Whereas whereas uh, uh, Lewis just went full time a couple of months ago, and then he had his yeah, kid yeah. born a couple of months early, so he now he took, did, yeah, uh, yeah. three months off from work to you know care for the baby. So that's why that company is not yet growing. He he's definitely very good at it, and I was very pleasantly surprised at how professionally he handled the whole of Venice. So I wish every publisher was that easy. Did you did you pitch did you pitch to him or did he? ask you about working uh, with him. Fabio Lopiano, the designer for Gusa, uh, is a friend of mine, and we were in each other's uh-huh. playtesting groups in London. Right. And and I played the Ragusa long before it was published, and uh-huh. I remembered it. And after the third publisher rejected uh, Venice because this game is great, but... Yeah. I went to Fabio and said, so how did you get Ragusa published? It's a three to five player, <laughs> high player interaction, super short, super dense game. How did anybody make say it, I'll publish it? And and he said, Well, I took it to this this guy to call Lewis, and the, the he worked with me to add a one and a two player mode to it, and and yeah. uh, we smoothened it out a little bit so it's not that mean, but it's still short and it's still dense. So I went to Lewis saying, Hi. I see you can turn three to five player uh, highly interactive uh, Mediterranean trading games 
into publishable pretty games. So how would you like a three to five player high density Mediterranean <laughs> trading game that you can turn into a publishing game? I was like, okay, let's get that. I set the game up. And then for the next 10 minutes, yeah. I kept talking at him for all the reasons he should not sign this game. Because I've wow. heard all the feedback. I mean, but yeah. it's a pickup and delivery. Everybody hates pickup and delivery. Oh, but you yeah, can yeah, block yeah. off other people's moves. Everybody hates being blocked off. There is yeah. direct player interaction when you have to decide which player gets the penalty point. Uh, if you get too many penalty points at the end, you're ineligible to win, which is essentially player elimination, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. It's like okay, do you want me to publish this game? I'm like, yes, look at the interaction. It's brilliant. Figure out how to make people <laughs> not hate the rest. I was like, okay, I'll take it away. And then we worked on it for a like half a year, like over the fence, dropping it back, dropping it forth. Then when he was like, okay, I think we've got it. Uh, mm. uh, he came up to London, uh, Andre Novak, who, by the way, is the CEO of Board and Dice, but Board and Dice yes. couldn't publish it for the exact same reasons, because it was too big to be a retail game, too small to be a big Kickstarter. So he yeah, flew yeah. over because he's very good at game balancing, and we played Venice for three days, the three of us. Uh, Andre wow. won every single game by doubling uh, poor Lewis's score. We finished balancing everything. <laughs> We're like, okay, the game is done. <laughs> we took it down to UK Game Expo. Uh, Polyhedron Collider played it. And I heard them the talking guys, about it, yeah. And one of them got blocked five turns in a row <laughs> and ended the game with minus one point. The winning I player remember, had six <laughs> I remember them talking about playing you and they say, and, never and, and play we David, like, never we play like, David at a game because he exactly, looks at a game we were, and he knows how to win it. He knows how to win the game straight away. And 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 we were like, this game is gonna be a catastrophic flop. Half of the people won't understand the strategies. One of them will get stuck, and because because the because if three expert players are playing, none of them get stuck. But if three newbie players are playing, one of them randomly gets stuck, and then one of the others win. Because they all bumble around, and one of those bumbles is a terrible move. They just don't know that yet. And we, we had one last day of development put aside for the game before we have to make the prototype copies. And yes. I was down in the countryside for some reason. And I was like, all right, on the way back, I'll pick you up. Uh, he lives in Southampton or 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 one of Portsmouth or one of those things. They all look the same. Uh, and and I went down, I picked him up. He sat in the car, like, okay, we got the three hour, two and a half hour drive to London. And two minutes into the drive, he goes, you're going to kill me. Why? I, I just had a shower <laughs> thought this morning. What if you could take an action where there is somebody else's boat? <laughs> I was like... <laughs> You just murdered the worker. That would never wait. Holy shit! That were oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and thus it is now physically impossible to get stuck in the game. So there you go. And every other problem we already solved long ago, but this was the last remaining problem that newbies maneuvered themselves into problems that killed them dead. It's like you're out. You you can keep taking actions, but it does nothing. And by saying you can always take an action, even if there is another boat, you solved everything. And 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 that was a passion project. That was that started from Andre showing me one of his half-finished games, and I said, "This is cool, but it would be cooler if they were boats and they were carrying their own goods, and it would be even cooler if the black cubes weren't negative points but player elimination." And 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 I did it because it it was fun and. I wanted the game with little boats going around. But after the work <laughs> that Lewis put in with us, it became yeah. a good game that should exist and people should love it. So now, first we got delayed by, by the Chinese Corona shutdown. Then we got delayed by Lewis's baby. But yes. I think it'll still ship this year, just a couple of months late. I'm not sure. I don't want to promise anything. But I am definitely very, very, very much looking forward to holding Venice because that was a passion project of mine that... That uh, that I almost gave up twice. Once when Andre said it's a great game, but me myself can't publish it, and then second when three publishers rejected it in a row. But but the work with Lewis was made it worth it. So you know, I'm sure is, I'll work you, in the future. Is there going to be another game following along? Are you going to do like a, the next game along from Venice? Then 
Are you going to consider? Oh, he already else? signed the game from from a friend of ours, a, a third member of the same London playtesting group at that ah, club cool. I attended. But I, I don't want to say more until he announces it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, there will mean, be go- a third game. Going back to um, Excavation Earth, I mean it's it's funded. Um, yes, and it's but doing. It's funded. I mean it's well funded. Um, uh, what are you uh, thinking? Are, are you, you know, seven hundred eighty backers. I would have been happier at, at a bit higher, but half of it is Corona, half of it is Frosthaven, half of it is selling a, he- a medium heavy euro on Kickstarter is 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 like flipping a coin because it looks pretty, but mm-hmm. the people who come here for the pretty say, what do you mean market manipulation game? That sounds boring. Where are my spaceships? X. Uh, <sighs> and, the, and the people who would love to play it go like, Oh, it's a pretty sci-fi box. I'm sure it's it's dice chucking shooty shooty. I won't even look at it. Or better yet, they say, I hate every Kickstarter. Those games are untested. <laughs> Have you noticed the um, change in Kickstarter? Have you noticed a slight change in Kickstarter over the last couple yes. of weeks? A couple of weeks or, or years. Well, even I mean last cut, I mean, even I'm surprised oh, some uh, campaigns are still going ahead. Um um, I don't know. To me, it's like there's been there's certainly been a difference in kind of like the manufacturing. There seems to be a lot of delays. Definitely going to be a lot of delays there are, happening. There and stuff are always like that, delays. So. Two years ago, uh, Korean shipping lanes were shut down for four months, and everybody was like, "This is yeah. the end of board games as we know it," and it was not. <laughs> so you know, I, I never say doom and gloom for the Kickstarter market. I can definitely say that people who are good at their own things. Are getting yes. better at it, and anybody who tries to stay out uh, to go outside of the lines just gets nothing. And and which is why I'm very excited this year for Tekken when I want into you, uh, my two new games with Board and Dice because they are big, they are reasonably pretty, they are reasonable, they are very smart, so they're they're for the thinky players, but they're not Kickstarters. And, All right, and, okay. and Board and Dice has the resources uh, on the heels of success of Teotihuacan to push a game using traditional means. Which means we don't have to inflate. We don't have to make it look cooler than it is. Yes, Dice yes. Settlers, my previous game with Board and Dice, because the dice were expensive to produce, they needed more money, so they went on Kickstarter. And, and they tried to make it cooler for Kickstarter. And because of it, uh, because of that, they, uh, they they made hip art for it, you know, to stand out on Kickstarter. And I love the Miko, don't get me wrong. But Dice Settlers is about fifty percent heavier than than uh, the ship uh, than Raiders of the North Sea. So anybody who bought that because oh, it has the Miko's art, it must be like Raiders of the North Sea, were yeah, yeah. dumbfounded. It had the name Dice Settlers, which. Hey, maybe it'll invoke the name of Settlers of Catan in some American markets, but it invoked it in the wrong people. Uh, then, because it was a Kickstarter, everybody was expecting beautiful, beautiful things, and then when the tents were tiny plastic tents, some of them badly sized in the first print run, then people complained. So our our best fans turned against the game. And then when it came out in retail, everybody... Yeah who would have loved it for the mechanisms, went, nah, it was some fancy Kickstarter that I didn't care about, I don't want it. So, so, and I'm thinking that Excavation Earth is having the same problem, just in a tougher t- climate. So Dice has got a lot of money, and then all the people complained that this is not what they thought it would be. And the, the people who actually liked it, didn't get it. Uh, uh, would have liked it, only got it much later, by the time it was not famous enough. Whereas Excavation Earth is now facing a much tougher climate, but with the same problem that it's too flashy for the conservative Euro players and too Euro for the for the uh, gimme gimme Kickstarter crowd. And yes, there is an interaction. I don't want to stereotype anybody. Obviously, there is yeah. 781 backers on the Kickstarter who have good taste and enough spare money besides Frosthaven <laughs> and Hank, which yeah. you know also doesn't help. But but I am looking forward. Like like I don't want to be the Kickstarter guy. Uh, the fact that Anachrony got super successful on Kickstarter and has minis that are functionally useful, and the fact that Mind Clash has a very 
strong core following of a couple of thousands of people that will just auto back anything they put on Kickstarter does not make me a guy who wants to work with Kickstarters all day long. Because the demands Kickstarter puts on my kind of games are unnatural. Uh, the Kickstarter is perfect for Eric Klang kind of games because they yeah. go for table presence, they go for player pieces. So, hey, let's add five more dudes on the map. Let's add ten more custom dice. Let's add three more board, si- sideboards. Those those are great. My, my heavy euros, how would I add three more sideboards and two more player pieces? You know, you'd have to re- yeah, you'd have to rebalance the entire game if you started adding extra exactly. pieces and so, boards and stuff so like that as well. Anachronic, it's not work. Yeah. anachronic kind of got lucky because it was a very soft system that we could add stuff to, so we could sate the Kickstarter's need for stuff. Plus, the game actually played better with minis, so we so when we <coughs> added the minis, it wasn't gratuitous, it was useful. But could you take ex- is it easier to take excavation earth? To retail, then I mean, is there going to be all this extra stuff that you have to consider to make it a viable retail? I don't type know. Uh, luckily, we have a few foreign partners. Uh, yeah. there is a bit of reserves, so I'm hoping that once there is five to ten thousand copies of on this market, some people mm. it will get to some people who will like it. Plus, always I trust my solo fans to try it out because it has a good solo mode. I'm hoping that mm-hmm. eventually my name recognition permits enough that somebody goes, oh, I like two other Turzi games, maybe I'll like this one too. But to stand out on Kickstarter, especially on a time of crunch and in between the two biggest games on market, is not enough. But I don't want to sound bitter. I want to sound analytic. I, I, I want to I wanna think about it. I want to say, what can I do to... I want my Kickstarter games to be more Kickstarter, and I want my barely Kickstarter games to be less Kickstarter. And now I'm using Kickstarter as an adjective. So uh, <laughs> most people. Use it as a program, I was which just, is, I'm just like, which I'm just letting you run with it. I'm just. But the yeah. fact is that everybody that's listened to this, when you say that is so Kickstarter, then they're going to know exactly. Exactly. What like, you kind of, what are you kind of, kind of talking about? Basically, what I'm trying to say is that the fact that, that despite the fact that Anachrony worked well being Kickstarter and Minecraft can do more good stuff on Kickstarter, I'm less and less believing in the need for Kickstarter inflation, essentially. And I and I want to work on projects that don't need Kickstarter inflation. And but- and and when and when Plastic Soldier Company puts uh, Roman Roll on Kickstarter doesn't even try to make it into a flashy Kickstarter because, you know, it's a small box game. Uh, the most mm-hmm, Kickstarter mm-hmm. thing they could do about it is that they can, because they have a small injection, uh, 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 they can make minis in-house, essentially, if in small quantities. Yes. So they were like, okay, for Kickstarter backers, the player pieces, which are meeples in the game, will also come with matching meeples. So... Uh, matching minis. So it's like the game really didn't need any Kickstarter stuff. And yet it was a unique enough game from a small comp- small-ish company. So it didn't have huge expectations. It didn't need to make 10,000 backers. But it made yes. 2,500 backers on a small marketing budget, which to, their, to date, their most successful Kickstarter. So as long as you don't need to invest a lot of money and need to make that all that money back, it can work. Or if you have something huge that has enough Kickstarter jazz to it, then that can also work. But the middle of the road, and most of my, especially non mind Clash games, are middle of the roads, that I'm starting to believe is not the game's fault that it doesn't do well on Kickstarter. I think there's just a, I think there's just a, 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 there's just a huge wave of hype that has to follow something, or exactly. there's a couple of key, couple of key people that manage to kind of kick, you know, to click things over. Because I don't and, even and question like affordability as well. You know, it's like this, yeah. you know, excavation of Earth is fifty bucks to get the base game, and it's seventy bucks yes. for the, for the envoy. Which, in the scheme of things, considering to what else is out there at the moment, exactly. then um, it's small. I hate to say it, but it's kind of small. It is relatively kind of small change, especially when I was looking at. Let's face it, 
I was looking. I did look at the Frost Haven um, um, campaign, and it's just I, 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 there's two reasons. <laughs> there's two reasons, and it's nothing against er- everything that Isaac's done. But there's two reasons: is that first of all, one of my friends has got Gloomhaven, and we've played. He's played nothing. He's really played next to nothing of it. He's not. We're not committed, and it's it's getting the games together and doing that, and that's fine. And secondly, there seems to be a huge level of cost, which is very, very because there's a bit of uncertainty for people's finances and stuff like that. For me, it's yes, pretty but, difficult to for me but, to, to yeah, put that money in. There is tens of thousands you know? of people who are willing to put that down because it's a BGG top one game. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and there's it's like there's tens of thousands. Do you know what it's like? Um, Somebody said to me that it's almost like there's the um, it's like the PlayStation where you get FIFA coming out and you get Call of Duty coming out. So you get you basically you get a core number of people, and what happens is that they put games out all the time, and they get so many sales figures. And then you get somebody puts the you know uh, EA puts the latest FIFA football game out on PlayStation Four or whatever, and you get. You know, you get a couple of hundred thousand people, or even a million people, crawling out the woodwork to buy that game because that is the only game that they buy for the places. And I reckon this is what we're getting. There is, there is, as there is like there is the there is the um, uh, the Cephal Fair crowd. There is this, you know, the Simon uh, come yeah, on crowd Cephal as Fair well. Used to be a tiny company, and they earned it. So I, I don't begrudge yeah, them exactly. at all. Plus, I second and and. and uh, and Price and many guys at at uh, Center Fair are, are good friends of mine. So so I don't mind them taking fifty thousand, but they found something that looks good on Kickstarter and and looks good everywhere on based on Gloomhaven's success. Both we said it will never sell in retail. It does sell in retail. Yes. Obviously not as well as Azul, but it does sell. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently. And I'm just looking at this. There's about two weeks left to go in the campaign. Yeah, about 14 days. Um, you know, you don't have to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I think it should. If you had the choice of, um, kind of pulling out, postponing it, and bringing it back and 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 re re releasing it on in a couple of months' time. Uh, is that something it, that you would consider? probably no because we already spent effort on getting so because because we said we can make the game out of what thirty thousand dollars and if yeah, we yeah. have to we can I don't mm-hmm. I'm, I don't want to say we want to but we can uh, mm-hmm. and and so the game is not going anywhere we're very happy with the game we just announced literally a, a huge bucket load of stretch goals that we were initially going to use as you know the 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 Look, here's the next time you go to chase, but we we're like, okay, yeah. this is how much we're gonna get. Let's make the best game we can make. So we uh-huh. we are announcing a bucket, like literally the update is gonna go out as we talk. Uh, so I have no regrets. I have things I've learned, but yes, but none, but none of those are mistakes. They are all things we could have done differently, but they, we haven't necessarily done them wrong. So I don't want to sound negative because I'm super happy with the game. If anyone is listening to this, go back it now because you have seen nothing like this before. Uh, if you care about market manipulation, set collection, dual use cards, games at all, if that sounds horribly boring to you, then I am sorry. It's your fault. <laughs> um, but, but yes, the, the the question in my mind is like, how else could we have advertised it? But but that's not like Corona hurts, Frosthaven hurts, Ang hurts. But but if we had something super special going on for this audience, then it wouldn't have mattered. So I think the biggest challenge I always face with every single game of mine is to find its yeah. audience because yeah. because I don't do staples. Some life would be easier if I was doing all Eric Lang games or all Uwe Rosenberg games or you know mm. because then. Then you know that if you like this and this, you like that. Whereas I keep coming back with every game of mine and telling people this is different, and they're asking, "Yeah, but is it good?" And I'm like, "Of course, I think it is good, but whether you like it depends entirely <laughs> on what you like because it's different." Yeah, yeah, but is it better than that one other game? No, it's nothing like that. So, 
So no, I I I refuse to be be sad about me trying to something different and and only a thousand ask people being ready for a leap of faith on in it. So hey, I've had uh, Days of Fire has what four five thousand copies of the game floating out in the market. Probably nobody yeah. has ever heard of it. But those 4,000 people who own the game all say, well, I've played it three, four times and it's surprisingly deep. It's extremely thematic. It makes me think yeah. about the theme that I would have never even thought about before. It's different. Mm. I can explain it to people who play Pandemic, yet it doesn't feel like Pandemic, etc., etc. So so I've, I've had games fly beneath the radar and come back later and say, yeah, this game is really appreciated. And Excursion Earth will have hopefully double the print run of that, even despite the Kickstarter numbers, because because now the publisher is more mature and we're not putting every egg in one basket. So so this is yeah. not a failure. This is I'm very happy with how the game turned out and 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 I'm very proud of all the work that Gordon and the team put into it. And and Yes, if we're if if the critical response is good, then we'll probably come back with an expansion in a year or so to say, hey, remember that game that you forgot to back last year, and then there are those three reviews <laughs> saying, Oh my god, it's an amazing game. How does nobody talk about them? Well, here's your chance yeah. to back it now. So uh, well, I, find I mean re- if you look at Anachrony, you'd kinda you didn't you kinda you different. came back once, with the expansion on Anachrony. Once you're in the top 200, yeah. people actively want you. Yes. Uh, when Die Settlers came back for the expansion, we didn't do a Kickstarter for it on purpose because we knew that people weren't begging for the expansion. But the fans of the game went, those couple of thousands of fans of the game went out and every fourth of them bought the expansion. And they will say yeah. the expansion makes the game even better. So we made the expansion to make them happy and to make us feel like we finished finished the journey of the game. Uh, so whereas making an expansion for Anachronist is completely different, people were, were like, we want to buy more Anachronist stuff. And obviously somewhere in my heart, I'm hoping that between Tekkenu, Tawantinsu, and Perseverance, the, the two big retail board and dice games and the new Mind Clash project, out of those three, I'm hoping at least one or two will end up in the in-demand category and not the what a nice game! Why does nobody talk about it? Category. So, but then at, at the same time, I'm not being funny, but the game is more than funded, and in any other situation, it would be seen as a rising success because it's more than you know. It's not just funded; it's another fifty percent of of the original target. So, I mean, it's not like. Yes. I'm no, no, no. That's that. what I'm that's saying. That's, I, I don't yeah. want to hear doom and gloom. If 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 I, I no. were to listen to this podcast, uh, hearing the designer mope about how what a tragedy that game is, then I wouldn't back it no, either. No, the game is a success. Before we were before Corona and 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 Frosthaven happened, and we were planning for stuff, we were hoping for different numbers, but 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 we're still gonna give the best game we can. And once the new stretch goals go out, that. Then, then all the quality blings that people keep asking for, we're gonna give to those. We, we, we take the game seriously. We don't want, don't skate by on anything. So go we'll back it. It's I'm really happy with the game. It's really unique. I always compare yeah. it to Brass because it has half a sentence in common with Brass, as opposed to all the other games that it has nothing in common with. So you know. Play it and tell well, me which game does well, the same thing better and that's 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 yeah. my job. Find a tiny tiny niche that has not been done to death and do it better. And uh, and as long as I can keep doing that, as long as none of my games are like, yeah, it's nice, but that other game is much better. No, I want to be that other game that does it better. And and that's what I think I achieved with Kitchen Rush, which is real time worker placement. Nobody even came close to that before Kitchen Rush. And there are many other real-time co-op games on the market, and some of them are amazing. Space Alert or Project Elite are milestones, and uh, I'm forgetting the name because I haven't played it yet, but there was another real-time one on on, uh, on uh, Kickstarter that the feedback was really good on. But could they capture the essence of a worker placement game? In re- so 
you know, you see what I mean. It's like I, I try to find those holes, and 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 there are many good dual use card games, uh, Glory to Rome or Race for the Galaxy being the obvious examples. There are many good market manipulation games, Raccoon Tycoon or Navigador or Clans of Caledonia being the obvious examples. Although the latter yes. is the former, because Navig- Clans of Caledonia is Navigador when it comes to market manipulation. I'm not sure it added much, uh, and <laughs> and. Uh, and the uh, heavy set collection games is a bit harder because set collection is mostly used in light games. But I mean, in a way, you look at it, Seven Wonders is a set collection game. So, you know, like individually, I haven't invented anything fundamentally new, but but put together in this way, I think I've done it better than anything I could compare it to or don't have anything I can compare it to. And, and that's my mission statement. Don't make an N plus one th- something. Make a better something, or better yet, the best something. Make it I'm going to say, t- yeah. I'm just going to say, if you dig something different, get Excavation Earth. There you go. Thank you. And and uh, and then there is another game you should ask me about because it launches on Kickstarter seven days from today. Called Defense that... of Procyon Three. Yes. And 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 when I said that Excavation Earth has no games I could compare its mechanisms to, then on mm-hmm. Procyon it it changes. There are no games I could compare it to. Full stop. And that's not true because I can compare it to to Vast and Quartermaster General a little bit, but right, only okay. a very 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 little bit. Plus putting Quartermaster General and Vast together in a sentence is already wild enough. So Defense of Procyon 3 is a two versus two heavy thematic war game that uses Euro card mechanisms, completely asymmetric. All four players use different card play to the point where the game comes with four 10-page rulebooks and says, at the beginning of the game, hand out a rulebook to every player. This rulebook will teach you exactly as much as you need to know about the game. And it will not teach you the whole game. It will teach you as much as you need to know. Not a sentence more and not a sentence less. Uh, Two players play as the human defenders of this colony. Two players play as the alien invasion force. And one player of each team plays as the ground commander. One player of each team plays as the space commander. There are two actual boards side by side. One shows the surface of the planet. The other shows the orbit around it. Mm -hmm. Uh, 114 miniatures. (laughs) Zero (laughs) dice rolls. Zero dice rolls. How are you managing? Okay, how are you managing zero? Because you said it twice. So I don't know if this is you just... In case I didn't, in case I missed it, or you and, just and then, like the, you know, then, then I realized I'm lying. There is actually a die roll at setup. Right, <laughs> so, so you're right. Okay, so zero dice rolls except for the one at the very, very beginning. Yeah, there is no, there is no <laughs> roll to resolve in the game. That's the proper way to put it. So when you take an action, you've taken that action. So it you strategize like you do in an euro game. Uh-huh. You manage cards with text effects on them like you would in an Ameritrash and it has a thematic immersion of an Ameritrash. Every rule is theme-driven. And what you do is you move your units around and you shoot like you do in a war game. So I went, can I make a game that is completely Euro, completely Ameritrash, and completely war game? No Hmm. compromises. And I went to the publisher and said, hi guys, I need couple of thousands of quids to, you know, hire an artist and write this rule book and stuff. <laughs> they were like, here's the check. Go make us a game. Wow. So, that's amazing because so, I'm, so, I'm gutted yeah. because I was asked about when I was going to go to Aircon, I was going to come to the PSC stand and actually have a show. We had it. a prototype there and we played four, uh, four half games of it. Uh, basically, I can teach each faction in about five to ten minutes. So I could teach the whole game in about 40. And then in the next hour and 20, they could play four or five rounds, most players. The game is 10 rounds long max. Right, okay. But most of my games tend to end on the seventh or the eighth round because there are several immediate victory conditions. Uh, and, 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 and especially people who like my games always go, oh, I don't like war games. 
Oh, I, I, I don't like randomness in battle. I'm like, good, because then you like this game. Yeah, yeah but it's a war game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they sit down. I hand them the cards and they're like, holy crap, there's so much stuff in this game. This is so complicated. No, 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 no. Look at the top of this player. On your turn, play three of those cards. Do what, it, what they say. Next. And then they play one turn and their mm. eyes open. And it goes, poop. I've spent two and a half years on that game. I didn't, like, my lead developer was a friend of mine who was playing with me. Uh, so while every other game of mine that, that comes out this big has a huge team, a publisher, million people working on it, improving it, UI mm. design, uh, graphic design, everything. Here, I did everything. I picked the artist. I told him what to draw. I told the graphic designer what, what I want to put where. I conducted the playtesting. I've played the game 30, 40 times full. I redesigned it twice from scratch because I wasn't happy with it enough. But at every point, it was a two versus two, fully asymmetric uh, the team game. Now there's a solo mode for it where you can one or two people can take Hello. control of one side and the bot takes control of the other side. So you can even play it as a cooperative game. Plays, once you know what you're doing, plays under at or around two hours. So it's not a four-hour crazy something. And it has 114 miniatures, so I'm hoping that the Kickstarter... Mm. I don't want to insult them because they are my potential buyers, but the people who are in the Kickstarter for the Kickstarter-ness of it will also find something to like. (laughs) Have you got... um... Have you, have you, when is the launch date for, for this then? When, when are you going well, to, when is uh, it? Have you got 21st a date? 21st of April, seven days from now. Wow. And have you got a price point on how much it's going to be for pledge levels or anything like that? Is that still to be finalized? Uh, it's it's going to be near $100. I, I need to check right. the exact numbers. But like, like the all in will be around there. Uh, the base pledge will be. 80 quid, which is, I believe, 99 US dollars these days. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, it's back to 101. Long live Boris Johnson. Um... <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, don't quote me. Don't quote me on that. that Hashtag too that's, soon. That's good in the, uh... that's good in the, that's good in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. For, oh, for, for, for anybody asking, I never had voting rights in the UK, but if I did, I'm not sure I would have voted for the fella. So I'm joking. Go. I'm definite I wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. But yeah, so the base pledge will be $101, which will already right. contain the 114 miniatures. Wow. And then there will be a small expansion for another 20 something, which will contain some more miniatures. And cool. a small expansion that I designed because they asked nicely. And the, uh, because uh, the Kickstarter the stretch goals will all be non game prep play related because I can't just shove another sideboard into the game as we've discussed. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to do testing and everything like that. Oh, the, the, the worse than that, it's because everything is so deeply interlocked. It's like if, if I change how much that unit can move per turn, then that wrecks the whole game. So my only luck is that my girlfriend is so good at beating the crap out of me at this game. So that when I come <laughs> up with a new mechanism, it's like, hey, babe, if I make a unit that does this and this, can you beat me with it every time? Or like, <laughs> is, is, is there a dominant strategy with that unit if it does this? And she's like, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. okay. So if I do it half that time, then I would never use it. Okay, then let's find something uh... in between the two. So... <laughs> Oh, yeah. dear. I so the, that's I have, a the best, a week. I have the world's best play play tester. Play tester. Well, Doing that's good. With me, so. There you go. Um, thank you very very much for coming on. I mean, I to, I'm literally to... happy to talk anytime. I mean, the, the fact that this other people good. might listen is actually just a bonus. There you go. <laughs> um, if people not only want to listen, but they want to follow you on the internet. Where Facebook, where do you... I'm, I'm on, on all the big board game Facebook groups. Um, okay. Yeah, all the big ones. And I'm happy to be tagged and I reply. I'm on mm-hmm. BGG, uh, where I maintain my profile page is an accurate and up-to-date list of all projects I've ever worked on, uh, released yes. or unreleased. 
Uh, plus, I uh, subscribe to every single game I worked on, so just ask a question and I'm probably going to see it soon. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm also on Reddit. I'm going to do a Reddit AMA in a week, so, you know, lots of fun stuff. Yeah. Lots of good stuff. Cool. What we'll do I'm, is we'll on, I'm not do- on oh. Twitter, and I don't want to be. Well, that's fine. I mean, who wants to be on Twitter? I don't think it's a choice. I think it's something you go on with, it's like, punishment. you know, positivity, and then you, you're you on it for 10 minutes, and you go, this is a, this is a great big cess, <laughs> cesspool hellhole, the hell site. Exactly. Oh. Um, if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, go to the internet and search for We Are Not Wizards, and you'll find us in all the various different places. If you like what you've listened to tonight, a couple of things you can do. Check out the campaigns and the links that we put in the show notes. Secondly, tell other people that we exist because that is how we spread like butter. I do have a funny uh, star story about wizards in board games. Because, I don't. Because I, a, a, f- a friend of mine always teaches every board game when he sets it up. It's like, so this game has a theme where <laughs> wizards or some shit, and then proceeds <laughs> with a purely mechanical explanation. <laughs> And and I'm trying to remember which game was it when he did this and the players are actually wizards in it. And, and, oh, and, and that was hilarious. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, um, I guess there's only a couple more things to do. The first, I mean, the first thing is to remember we're many things, but we're not wizards. So um, are we yeah. wizards, David? I am definitely not a wizard. There you go. Then <laughs> the second thing is to say goodbye. And so goodbye. it's a goodbye, goodbye from the wonderful, fantastic David Torsi. Say goodbye, David. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe more than ever. Stay home. Rule sixes. Make something awful. And until the next time, um, don't go digging about for any old game that's maybe going to leave you cold and frosty. Go and have yourself a proper excavation. Maybe consider excavation <laughs> Earth. But until the next time, goodbye. Goodbye. Wizard is never late. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to.